Hey, Jack, good morning. Hey, Tariq, how's it going? Doing great, doing great. Today we are starting Sommelier This Week uh, with Jack and team, and this is our first episode. So we are super excited today, March 19th, to have Jack give us an introduction into Sommelier's prior week and what's, we, what's happening and our deep dives. So, Jack, good morning. And, uh, and how was this past week for you on Ethereum DeFi, DeFi and how is it wrapping up? Yeah, you know, it, it's been a really exciting week here at Sommelier. We, we, we've got a lot going on, um, you know, in addition to the front end that we launched, I believe last week was launch, right? Or was that the Woo! week before? It yes, was last, last week, week was launch. <laughs> so uh, that, that is a, a huge part of what's going on at Sommelier development was supporting launch and, and making sure that that went smoothly. Um, a lot of work went into the data engineering uh, to support the graphs that you're seeing on app.sommelier.com, as well as you know that front end itself. Multiple iterations, design, as well as user testing. And uh, even then, there's always issues on launch, and the team did a fantastic job responding to those. Kevin and Lucky are, are doing amazing work on that front end. So that's, that's an entire line of work um, and an entire effort that the development team is doing. And then also in parallel, we're working on the back end. And on the back end, there's a number of really key pieces of infrastructure that we're going to dig into over the, over the course of this call. And I'll talk yep. through the... Um, sort of the preparedness and readiness of each of those individual pieces, as yep. well as the integration of the whole. Is awesome. that a good? Uh, is that a good framing there? That's a great framing, which kicks off one of our first questions. You know, we heard about Sommelier's test nets number one and test net number two. These were private. Um, tell us a little bit about the private test nets. What are those? What happened? Yeah, that's 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 a great question. So, um, you know. Just to sort of back up a little bit, the sommelier protocol uh, is made up of kind of three key pieces right now. One is the gravity bridge technology that we're working very closely with not only Althea, but also injective protocol and now some other folks within the Cosmos ecosystem to develop. And we've the Althea team has been doing a lot of test nets. We as sommelier have been actively supporting those test nets as well as participating and contributing improvements upstream into uh, the core gravity uh, repository. That's a massive engineering effort. Obviously getting this sort of cross-chain communication and these bridge technologies correct is the foundation on which everything else we're building goes. So there's a lot of effort going on there. Um, we are currently working on a refactor of some of those internal systems and working on smoothing out how gravity is deployed. And part of the test net that we were doing was ensuring that, that we had the inter internal competency to A, deploy gravity, as well as B, get some user experience feedback as users of gravity deploying that, as well as the different the other different aspects of our platform. Awesome, and, question for you. What was the yes. experience like? So you said you guys got experience. What was it like? Yeah, so uh, gravity is one piece of it. The Oracle is another piece of it. And then there's a module that consumes both of those in order to provide this stop loss functionality that sort of sits on top of all that. So for gravity itself, there's additional processes that you need to run to follow data from Ethereum. You need to run an Ethereum light client as well as a couple of other things. And then the Oracle technology that we have also requires running graph nodes and uh, an Oracle feeder. What's a graph can... node? Yeah, that's, that's a great idea. So we talked a little bit about at the beginning of the call about the data infrastructure that's required um, for the front end and that there was a lot of engineering effort behind the scenes to ensure that that data is timely, i.e. when you load the page, it shows up really quickly and uh, it's as fine grained as users need it to be to do the type of analysis they need. And if you wanna get that data by querying the blockchain systems directly, it would take way too long and you would need to run quite a bit of really redundant infrastructure. And historical queries still would be very difficult because you have to do a lot of historical queries in order to populate a few months of a graph. So the way that in many systems, and, and if you look at legacy banking or you know, uh, ad tech markets, the way that th this normally works is you have a separate database that's essentially caching that data and providing it in a much more structured way and doing those historical queries ahead of time. So when the user 
requests that data, it, it comes out really quickly. So this um, is about historical queries, just really querying yes. historical data on the Ethereum yeah. blockchain, correct? Yeah. So what is data similarly as well as what is as well as applications solution? as well as application specific data? So perfect. What is the familiar each, solution? Why don't you tell yeah. me the familiar solution? Tell us more about what it is. Is that you said the graph? What exactly is that? Yeah, so the graph is one way of doing this for Ethereum data. And, you know, most folks have probably heard of the graph token, but the reason why they launched the graph token is they had a very popular indexing service that allows you to use a common query language called GraphQL that's uh, really efficient at fetching data and returning only the necessary data to the client. Um, and a nice way to declaratively say this application, these are the different objects I need to index and, and this is where they are within Ethereum state. And there's some very specific application data that we need for Uniswap. And obviously if you look at ETH gas prices, Uniswap is consistently the top gas user on Ethereum. So you can imagine the amount of trades and the amount of state that is uh, present within just the Uniswap system, uh, it's, it's quite this a lot. A, this is trading data. So what you're trying to say yeah. is that in the Ethereum blockchain, all the historical trades on Uniswap are on the blockchain and you need to read a query this, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, when you're running a node, not every node has all of this data. A lot of nodes just keep recent data and, and they don't index that historical data. So th there's a lot of work that has to go into, you know, indexing and efficiently serving that data. And as a validator, you need to provide a list of what the top hundred or thousand markets are on Uniswap. Um, and you're updating that feed continuously. So to, to talk about, the, to, to bring this back to the test nets and to anchor this in, in what we were talking about originally, there's Cosmos validators are normally used to running just one process, which is the validator and maybe a couple of sentry nodes and, and a few other things. But in order to properly run a validator on the sommelier network, you need to run an Ethereum node, you need to run an indexing service, and you need to also run uh, processes to submit transactions from both of those onto the blockchain. Wow, and that's it, pretty big. So you're saying you have yeah. to run like multiple pieces. I mean, how many is that? It's like seven pieces of software you need yeah. to run? Yeah, wow, I, that's I, amazing. I think when we installed, it was like five. <laughs> got so, it, got it, got it. Um, how long did it take you and a team to install all of these five pieces in your first private testnet? Yeah, so all of the development work we've done so far is just building out the raw functionality to make this network happen. And I think that the positive learnings from this are we have all that functionality built out and it works, which is great. <laughs> the, the learnings that, that, that we need to take back and, and really reflect on are how do we make this easier for users and how what do we made make it hard sustainable then? for a public so network? What, what made it well, hard? To reach, tell us what I, made I think, it hard. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that you just mentioned, installing all those different pieces of software and figuring out what the order in which you start them Ah, and you need okay. different different pieces of configuration from, let's say, the, the blockchain node requires some contract addresses on Ethereum. Right. And this order of operations, especially as you add more and more pieces, becomes increasingly difficult. And right. one of the things that we did really well when we launched Cosmos and when we were working on that system was ensure that we had a really, really tight system startup that's very easy to do in a decentralized fashion. And these initial test nets, what I'm looking at is places where there's sort of an impedance mismatch. What so I was just question talking for about, you, yeah. I'll jump in, in there. So are you saying that you use the Cosmos expert, uh, you use your Cosmos expertise for bringing up a Cosmos network, essentially for Somalia? Is that what you did? Yeah, absolutely. You know, that that's the that's the base. And then we're adding on these additional layers of complexity. And, yep. and we're gonna also take the time now to, well, we, we're gonna have to uh, take the time now to ensure that that's able to be run by the average validator. And yep. it's also a little less error prone because right now th there's a lot of opportunity for human error. And ah. we can change some small pieces of ordering during this startup procedure to make it drastically easier and way less error prone. Got it. 
Well, let's talk a little bit more about this Oracle module. You said this was another piece. What is this Oracle module? Why is it important? Yeah, so uh, you know, th there's a lot of discussion about oracles and, and people, people love to talk about it, but essentially what it is, is anytime you have a state machine or an application and, and Samuel Ye, this application that we have is a state machine and, and it relies on external data. So how do you certify the data coming in that you're relying on to make these really mission critical decisions? And in Samuel Ye, the the security model that we're comfortable with is that we're relying on a vote of the validators to provide us with reliable and consistent data. And what that means is that even if one validator or a small group of those validators is producing fraudulent data, trying to profit off of market movements, um, that will be ignored. And the, the real data that is voted on by the vast majority of those validators is gonna be what the system uses to make decisions. And th this is a very secure Oracle design that requires you know, all of the validators. So in the case of Sommelier, that's probably gonna be on the order of 30 to 60 different independent parties to bring the same data to the party. And that gets averaged and smoothed out and then committed to the state machine. And then that's what we're using to uh, check to see if there's impermanent loss on your positions. That's awesome. That's awesome. So you, uh, so why don't you use something like link uh, or chain link to, for this type of functionality? Yeah, well, so Chainlink, you know, has their own Oracle network that that, that has a process through which it works. Um, but the way that most applications bring this data in is they say, here's four different keys that are authorized to bring that data in. And this is the way most Ethereum DeFi products work. And, you know, most Ethereum DeFi products are also based on top of a multi-sig. So they're mm -hmm. very comfortable and familiar with this security model of saying these four or five named parties are responsible for the security of this network. Right. Over on the Cosmos side, we've really tried to engineer out uh, <laughs> reliance on a named subset of responsible parties <laughs> and tried to make these networks permissionless and, and you know, trustless as, as, as far as you can. And instead of saying we're comfortable with this small subset of folks bringing this data in, we're saying we're really not comfortable with that. That's not a good security model. And that's not a really reliable long-term way to bring that in. If you're thinking about a threat model against a system like that, all you have to do is compromise one or two of those keys in order to compromise the entire system. And that really, that, that backdoor essentially, which is what you're writing, you're writing a small backdoor that allows a small subset of keys to control the system. Um, th that backdoor is exploitable and, and degrades the security of your system as a whole. So, so the, are the, you saying that uh, Similia will be Similia's price oracles are going to be more secure than Chainlinks. Uh, you know that's uh, that, that's in the eye of the beholder. Um, I well, that's not an answer. That... What's the answer? Yes or no? <laughs> yes. Yeah, for sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, tell us about testnet three. So, are you going to have a third testnet? Yeah. So, uh, basically, what I what we ran into and and what a lot of the learnings from this were were the exact order of operations to start up one of these network, to start up a sommelier network right now needs some changing. And what I've been doing over the last day and what I will do today primarily is write up a much more easy and much more asynchronous way to do this. And then we're gonna start running more frequent and persistent test nets as an internal development team and work to uh, fix some of these order of operations issues with network boot. And uh, yeah, so testnet three, likely this weekend or early next week, whenever I get those instructions out and we get enough keys from folks internally to start up this new network, we'll go ahead and do that. Um, mm -hmm. And part of this formalizing this process will also allow us to bring in community members and folks who are interested in becoming validators within the next couple of weeks. So if you're interested in validating on sommelier, stand by. We're going to have a lot more information for you soon, and we'll start doing public test sets here soon. That, that is awesome. I know a lot of the community wants to know 
how they will essentially get to participate as, as validators? Is there anything they should read upon or prepare so that they get ahead and get you know, their hands on prepara preparation for being a validator on the Somalia network? Yeah, so you know, if you're validating on any Cosmos SDK based network, I would say that's kind of a prerequisite. This is going to be like validating on Cosmos SDK plus <laughs> plus plus more complexity, plus more pieces, plus a much much more complex system. Um, what are the skills yeah. required to be a good validator then? Ops. Well, what they used to call ops, what we now call DevOps, um, but it is, you know, the set of skills that are required to run persistent web services across a wide variety of disciplines. And I think that folks with more traditional ops experience working in, let's say a large corporation that has a data pipeline with a few different layers of caching and servers with a, a major database that, anyway, if, if you look at a lot of these SaaS companies and, and other major corporates, the systems that they run are very complex and multi-layered and have a number of different components to them. And that's much more similar to what we're doing with Sommelier than let's say running a Cosmos SDK based blockchain, which is essentially just one process that's signing things continually and you're adding layers of security to that with centuries. Um, Sommelier has more data requirements. It has requirements between different services. You know, as the co-processor for Ethereum, you can imagine we're deeply intertwined with an Ethereum blockchain. And right. with that comes a lot of Ethereum tooling, a lot yep. of Ethereum expertise that, that is, I think, going to be new for a lot of Cosmos validators. There's a lot of folks that come over from the Ethereum community and are really comfortable with that tooling. So it's, maybe it's going to be easier for those folks than for others. But this is, uh, you know, an additional competency that you're going to need uh, as, a, as a sommelier validator. Awesome. And can folks come into the Somalia Telegram or Discord and reach out to you and say hello and, and talk about what yes, they, they want to Yes, they can. Please, okay. please come to uh, t.me slash get some yep. and uh, ping me or Tariq or Mario. And we're happy to help you out with uh, any of your questions that are related to sommelier and potentially even talk to you about wine. Um, but that's only after five. <laughs> that is. All right. Thanks so much, Jack. We will see you next week with the, the weekly update on Familiar. Have a great weekend. Absolutely. Yep. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.